Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Um, just a reminder, homework six is posted. I don't expect that you can actually read the font on all of this. Try to zoom in a little bit. We're about here in our class schedule, so we're about through the introduction of everything. We're going to be picking up steam. So this homework is going to mimic a lot of the stuff that we do in class. I'm almost going to be giving you the exact answer. I might have you walk through things a little bit differently in this homework. Um, it's not to, meant to be overly difficult, but they will be getting increasingly more difficult throughout the semester. So we're still kind of building strength in just learning the Bayesian nomenclature. What are these priors? There's been lots of theoretical questions already, like why do we know this is good? And we haven't answered those questions you know, to the, the fullest degree, and that's what the whole semester is about. So first week of class, I said Bayes, likelihood times prior. We talked about that nomenclature. You know, what a likelihood function actually is. And then we talked about a class of priors, conjugate priors. So later we're going to learn some of these priors that we're already using have special properties. So we're going to be continuing with that, those questions. If you feel along the way uh, you want to know where we're going, feel free to ask questions. And if it's already in a lecture, I'll probably say, well, let's hold off and I'll do what I've done so far. And I'll just say the answer real quickly to inspire confidence. So, and tell you that there is an answer to this and we'll get to it. Um, so we're right here. So homework one is out. It's due September 22nd. I think what we'll do, there's two Thursdays between, not including tomorrow, there's two more Thursdays before this is due. So I think what we'll do is do a review session next Thursday, and probably one after. So there might be just random questions that you guys have. So just want to talk about things, make sure I'm clear, let's work through this calculation, can you slow down and address this point? You're allowed to ask all of those questions, so let's treat it like kindergarten. You know, you know what I mean. So we'll bring down the level and treat it like we're going to do a tutoring session maybe. So that's what the review sessions are really about. I imagine the one right before homework you guys will be asking, how do you do problem number four? So instead of asking me how do you do problem number four, try to articulate a real question, what it is about problem four. I can understand if you say, I just have no idea. So if we really are there, um, I can take, I can drive from there and try to explain it. There's homework one. So the other one is mostly just who's in the class or getting acquainted with each other. Um, we'll have those graded and back to you, but I don't think that there's going to be anything that's going to ding anybody's grade. You might miss a point or two, and so the intention is for homeworks like that, everybody gets approximately full credit. Things that would keep them square in the A solid A range. Um, Remember the, the grading scheme is minus one for on a problem if you've just made the most minor of error. If you see on a problem minus one, minus one, that's different than minus two. That means there's two little tiny errors right here. Have a look at them. So minus two means you should have been able to recognize the error. Minus three means you butcher the problem, and minus 10 means you missed the entire problem. You didn't attempt it. If you do two non-attempts, we won't grade it. So, um, just as an announcement, I'm probably going to be grading the homework in this class. I'm considering loaning my TA out to somebody else. So I have another job in the department that requires me to smooth over problems for other people. So I think the, the casualty will be to me, and you'll have the point person right here for grading your homework. I still intend that Yui will do one hour of office hours every week on Zoom. So he's TA for the class. He knows the homeworks. He's done this multiple times, so he's still a good resource. So we'll keep that locked in. He sent me a Zoom link yesterday saying, oh, no, I forgot about this. We'll use it starting next week. I don't think we have anything to really discuss quite yet that we can't do in the 20 minutes after class. Am I about right on all of that? That's where I think we're at. OK, homework one, problem one. Xi's are normally distributed. I don't write the IID on there. It's got two parameters, but I'm going to assume Sigma is a known fixed parameter, so you're not doing inference on it. It's just like a number in your analysis. But I like to write it in anyway. In this problem, we'll infer the observed x's, so we get these things. Um, in the x, 
will infer from the observed x size the posterior sampling distribution. And I wrote it out as p mu given x. Um, there's something a little bit ambiguous about this notation. Where did sigma go? And so, and there's something implied in the problem. I've already told you sigma is a fixed known parameter. And sometimes you'll see people write it down, and sometimes you'll see it out of the equation. And you would always ask yourself, did they integrate that thing out of the equation and marginalize it away? Or is it in there? And since I wrote right here sigma squared is a known fixed thing, you're not going to integrate over something that's fixed. It's a number in there. And so if you would like to write comma sigma squared right here, that would also be reasonable. So my notation will kind of flip around just a little bit to get you acquainted with what everybody else does. So very often on a homework, I'll find two different ways to write the same thing. And it's so that you're used to that when you go to seminar or something like that. Um, they sh everything I write should be at least in the realm of correctness that I see other people do. So that's just a heads up. What's the likelihood function? I'll probably write that down today. Under the reference prior, here's a word that I haven't really told you what it means. When I do that and I tell you what the prior is, this is the flat prior. We were discussing this last time. We'll discuss it again this time and go into a little bit more depth with it. Not all the depth that we need to go into, but some of the depth. So there'll be multiple reasons why this might be a good prior. And we'll go into some of the reasons, each one, um, one at a time. I'm not going to say all the reasons at all at once. I would say there's probably five or six good reasons to pick this prior. Um, it's not the only thing going. If you see a term like this, and I've italicized it, it means look it up. So go to wiki, reference prior, and just read it. And if you don't understand it, we'll get to it. So I just want you to familiarize yourself with this. This is a term that most people use. In a one-dimensional analysis, I'll just say this, it's equivalent to the Jeffries prior. But the mathematical formulation of a reference prior is not exactly the same. Only in 1D are they the same. And I'll address this towards the end of class, but I would still like you to get used to what the language is that people use. So reference prior is probably a pretty good name. It means like what most people do. And it probably is what most people do. We'll be addressing the reasons why during class. We're just not there yet, but it doesn't mean that you can't compute a posterior distribution using this prior and the likelihood induced by this sampling model. Okay, problem two, we've been studying this. This is the beta binomial problem. So I just want you to specify a prior, dis specify the posterior distribution given that you're using the beta prior. We've done this in class. I just want you to do it again and just write it down. Here's a problem that's eerily similar to problem one. This is YIs are normally distributed. This air term is normal right here. So and it has some covariance. This is the mean function. This is regression. So I will say this. Um, the math, I would say, is exactly the same right here that you do. At least to me, it's exactly the same. But yeah, there's a little bit difference in the, the notation that we use and the terms that are going in this. The idea is you see some XIs and you want to figure out what the betas are in this sort of model to try to linearly associate them with the YIs. And that's a basic statistical formulation. It's the, not the only thing statisticians do, but they certainly do it a lot. So linear regression. Um, I think I say right in here what the, the priors are that you're going to be using, what the notation is, and I start introducing yourself your, yourself to uh, matrix notation. So this is a normal distribution and this is written in a multivariate manner. Possibly if you're not familiar with that, we might need to cover some of this in review session. So if you see this multivariate normal thing and you're like, I don't know what this is. That's a determinant function. What are all these terms? Can I write it differently? Is this useful to write it this way? You can write it differently. You can write it using the sum notation. And this matrix multiply is summing. So it's the same thing. So this is a quadratic form right here in matrix notation. And you can write it you know, as an expanded quadratic form that's super messy. We will be going through this stuff slowly in class. But if you need help 
with kind of matrix notation next Thursday would be a really good time for, for that, covering that. But this is a multivariate analog to problem one. So I do kind of tell you what the answers are. So I say do a comparison. So you're going to come up with a posterior distribution for beta, just like you would in any Bayesian analysis, given the y's and the x's, tell me what you think the betas are. Only answer that's a little bit different, what Bayesian does is they provide you uncertainty measures for the betas, the full joint distribution of the betas. Very typically, the estimators that people use for estimating the betas are, is this thing, x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Those are the least squares equations, so the normal equations, you might say. This is the maximum likelihood estimator. So if I took the likelihood function that we would get from this sampling model, just like we usually do, and I maximized it, the betas are maximized at this point. So these are standard MLEs, maximum likelihood estimators. So I don't tell you that right here, but you might look that up if you see this and go, what's an MLE? It's the maximum likelihood estimator. It's the thing you get when you estimate the, the uh, maximum. You probably wouldn't be surprised if you ended up figuring out that that's the posterior mean for the posterior distribution of beta. And the way you can think about this is I've got a normal distribution. It's the sampling model. When I look at the likelihood function, it also looks normal. And I'm multiplying it by a flat prior. So what we're really doing is we're maximizing the likelihood because I'm taking the likelihood times one, that's the posterior, but likelihood times one, that's the posterior. Is it the likelihood or is it the posterior? So we might change the language, but the estimator you get is exactly the same. Um, you also get a variance, and I'll, I'll just give you a hint. The variance for beta hat right here, the variance of this estimator is exactly the same as the posterior variance. So this is a problem where all of your classical analysis coincides with the Bayesian analysis under this prior. So you might be feeling, wow, we're going to rethink about all these problems we already know how to do and just change the whole vocabulary, but the Bayesian totally agrees with the non-Bayesian in this problem. That's actually pretty good news because a lot of people do regression. It probably doesn't matter if you're a Bayesian or a non-Bayesian, it's just how you interpret everything. So I'll let you think about that a little bit. There's an excerpt from a book that I read a while ago. Peter M. Lee wrote a book on Bayesian statistics. I used to use it as the textbook in this class, but I like Peter Hoff's book as a reference a little bit better. He makes a statement in his book, and when I was first reading the book, it wasn't obvious to me that the statement is true. So I provide you a supplementary file with the statement from the book. I typed it all out myself. So it's an excerpt from Peter M. Lee's book. And I want you to justify the statement in there. Ultimately, this is like a STAT 101-esque type problem, one of these little word problems. And they ask you to use Bayes' theorem in it. I will point out, they give you a bunch of numbers in the problem. All the numbers are useful. And there's a sentence in the excerpt, and we can look at that maybe next Thursday at review session. And it says, there's no innocent explanation of the data. So there's a murder scene, the data is blood at the murder scene. The blood type of the, the blood is the, the information, and they're going to match it to an individual. No innocent explanation of the data means that an innocent person didn't walk by the crime scene and go, wow, there's a crime scene here. I'm going to bleed all over the place, and then I'm going to take off. That didn't happen. What they're saying in that statement is the blood belongs to the killer. So I'll let you read through that. There's something called the prosecutor's fallacy, and sometimes you'll hear this discussed on things like NPR, where they're discussing probability with people and trying to figure out if lawyers actually understand all this stuff. The answer is no, they don't. Doctors don't understand it either, but we're there to correct them. So it's a fun problem. Not at all obvious to me what they were saying in the paragraph, so there's a little bit of math to um, here's a basic problem about transformations. So this isn't necessarily even a Bayesian problem. I just want you to transform some random variables. We could also have a discussion about that next Thursday. So if you're confused about transforming random variables in 1D space or high dimensional space, I can build in a, a lecture for you 
maybe next Thursday. So you have to let me know where you're at so we can try to cover some of these bases. So that's the, the homework problem. There's also a simulation assignment. You'll probably want to get started on this. So this part's a little bit long. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be simulating confidence intervals. So you're going to be sampling from the binomial model. So numbers of successes, you could sample in Bernoulli's, count how many ones you have. And sometimes people are, will approximate the binomial with a normal. And they'll develop confidence intervals out of that normal for P. So what's P hat? It's usually X bar. P hat is X bar right here. This is the standard air. The 1.96 is an asymptotic approximation that matches the normal. It's not precisely 1.96. There's more decimal places. Some people round that number to two and say two standard airs. And so if you talk like that, that will make you like everybody else. Um, I want you to just check to see how good this interval is. So the idea is, is that there's a true P that you're going to simulate. So I'll say there's a true P. Let's say this is P true. I'm going to simulate some data. So I'm going to get a data set. I'm going to call it X1 right here. What is X1? It's a vector of ones and zeros. Something like that. There's some sample size right here, and we're going to call it n. Okay? So that's the vector. What we're going to do from this is we're going to compute p hat, which is some of the xi's, over n. So that's going to be the number of successes. We're going to take this thing, and we're going to add and subtract 1.96 p hat, 1 minus p hat, square root divided by n. So this is an asymptotic approximation to the normal, and if you've taken a STAT 101 class, I use that metaphorically. Uh, we don't actually have that number at Virginia Tech, but you get it. So they teach this in high school. So later on, we do this in grad school too. We go into more theory on it. So we usually say it's not the best thing to do out there. So you come up with this interval right here. Subtracting off gives me a left end point. Adding gives me a right end point. So I wind up with an interval from this data set. So this is going to be the left and this is the right. And the question is, is did it cover the truth? And in this example, if that were the left end point and that were the right, it's covered the truth. So the idea with the confidence interval is that if I repeat this process, some fraction of the time, it will cover the truth. So this is supposed to be a 95% interval. So the idea is, if all the theory is right, and really that concerns n, if n is big enough, then it will cover 95% of the time. Now what they didn't tell you in STAT 101, probably, is if n is small, or if p is close to boundaries, it doesn't work. So, if P is in the middle of the space and N is moderately large, like maybe 31, so, or something like that, that's bigger than 30, so, then it probably works okay. But if P is somewhere different in that space, it changes how well this performs. So not all P's are equal, in some sense. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna repeat this over and over again. I'll say, we're gonna collect an X2, an X3, and we're come up, come up with repeats of all of this. So there's another interval that maybe covered, maybe this one didn't cover. And I'm gonna do this some number of times and I'm gonna check the rate of coverage. So, and I give you some numbers in here for how many times I want you to do this. So simulating 95% confidence interval. So this is the confidence interval right here. I think I tell you right here for each P, and I want you to pick a whole sequence of P's. You're not going to do it for one P. You're going to do numbers between 0 and 1. So I say start at 0 0.01, go up to 0.99 with step size of 0.01. You can count how many of those there are. So under each value of P, generate the binomial random variable when N is equal to 30. Boom, right there. Repeat this 1,000 times. 
So this I've repeated three times right here. But I want you to repeat it a thousand times. And then for each value of P, you can compute the relative coverage rate. How many of these actually covered the truth? So what you would get at the end of the day is a plot that looks like this. P, this is going to be cut up into 199 different partitions. So 100 different partitions in here, 99 different separators. So 0 0.99, 0 0.01. The idea is, is that you're supposed to cover 95% of the time. So if you want to make this 9,500, I don't, or 950, I don't care. If you want to scale it to be 95%, I don't care. The plot will look the same. And so you're going to check the coverage rate, and I'll tell you around 0.5 right here. Probably the coverage rate's going to zig and zag right around here. Towards the end point, you're going to see some interesting behavior. It's going to start tanking. It won't cover as well as it's supposed to. This will not be smooth. So it's going to jig and jag. And I want you to think about something when you're doing this. What's the jaggedness all about? Is that simulation error? Is that Monte Carlo error? If I cranked up the, not, the 1,000, would that disappear? The answer is no, it won't. So think about why. Don't actually ask that on the homework. What I'm going to have you do is you're going to change what n is for all of this and then you're going to increase n, you're going to end up doing this, n is equal to 30, and then later on you're going to do this for n is equal to 50, n is equal to 100, n is equal to 1,000. And you'll plot all those curves. And probably as n increases, this behavior gets a little bit better, and it doesn't dip as far near the end points. Problem B, part B, or this part, part two of whatever the zero of part, of this is. You'll notice that sometimes I'm a little sloppy with my A's, B's, and C's and my numbering and all of this. It's usually because I'm adding sections to homework throughout the years. But I think we can all read through this. For the Bayesian thing, you're going to construct the beta distribution. For the posterior, you're going to construct a 95% interval out of that posterior. And that will give you different air bound, different left and right bounds than the normal approximation. So you're going to base those off of the beta distribution, and so you probably look at the, the quantiles of the beta distribution. And I tell you how to do that. I tell you how to do it in a perfectly simulated way. I will tell you if you do it this way, you will need several days for the calculation to complete. There is a faster way to do it. And if you discover that, a theoretical thing that you can use that's faster, and it's probably even more accurate, if you can discover it, it'll turn your code into lightning fast. You won't have to wait so long, and you can use that. You don't actually have to simulate the quantiles. There's a quantile function for a beta. If you didn't know that that function existed, you might do this, do a Monte Carlo sampling from that beta. This is the part that's going to be excruciating and take up all of your time. So what I say in doing this is sample from the beta distribution, the posterior beta, it's going to be some of the xi's plus alpha, n minus some of the xi's plus beta, that will be the beta. You sample from that beta, I said 10,000 times, it's a lot of times, and from that, order it, those 10,000 draws, and give me the 250 biggest one and the 9,750th largest one. What do you think the expensive part of that calculation is? It's the order. Reordering everything is actually probably the most expensive thing in that. And it's going to take a lot of time to do because I ask you to repeat this over and over and over again to simulate, to simulate those quantiles. So you're going to do the same thing. Compare how the asymptotic frequentist thing works. This is supposed to be frequentist. So, also the notion of a coverage interval is a frequentist concept. So anytime you hear the word frequentist, you're thinking about, oh, it's some rate, this repeated rate of being able to do something. So there's this repetition involved. And so sometimes we like to think about probabilities as the amount of successes we see in some number of trials, that's a rate. 
the coverage rate right here is a frequentist concept. Um, Bayesians don't necessarily subscribe to that, but there's no reason that they can't. What you'll notice for the Bayesian interval, if you plot it on top, it will not have this artifact, right? It's not an artifact. It won't have this behavior. It'll be much tighter all the way across the thing. It won't be perfectly uniform, and you can try to figure out why. But it's really those that beta half-half prior that's popping everything up near the endpoints that's giving support to the coverage over when P is small. So some of you have been wondering, why does that beta half-half in that U shape? Why do we like that, and why do we like to penalize the endpoints? It's actually probably because of examples like this, where we want to penalize these endpoints because the frequency of the observations isn't enough to really estimate this probability over here. So you need some penalties involved, and that's what the beta half-half is doing. So you've got a couple weeks to work on this. If you get bored, start on this. So if you start on that the night before, you won't finish. So it'll take a little bit of time. Any questions about all of that? So I do have this question right here. If P true is 0 0.001, how large would N need to be so that 95% credible interval covered within 1% of the nominal rate? I asked the same question for the confidence interval. So there is this little question in here. P was small, so something tiny in here, 0 0.001. How big would this N need to be so that the confidence interval, this little behavior, gets pulled right up here and it starts covering, it doesn't need to be 95%, I say within 1% of the nominal rate. So if it's 94, I'll be okay. If it's 96, I'll be okay. For this problem, I feel okay about that. So it doesn't need to be exactly 95% because nobody is. You could, but nobody ever does that. The, the exact thing it feels like. There are exact covering procedures out here. I will point out this is optimal frequentist, the Bayesian thing. So the question is, is how big does N need to be for the confidence interval procedure to have this thing jig and jag right around 95%. Anybody have an idea how big N would need to be? Like 32, right? They said in my STAT 101 class, 30 was a good safeguard. What do you think? What's a big number? 5,000. Yeah. So it's bigger than that. So it's more like 10,000. But you guys can tell me. How are you going to do that? You'll fiddle, fiddle around with your code and trial and error that thing. There are other procedures you can set up an adaptive thing that will search out that N for you, but you'll probably just crank up N and see what the smallest N is so that you're reliably around 95% and report that number. You don't have to be exactly. If you tell me 12,000 or your simulation took 7,000, I'll be okay with that. If you tell me it's 150, I'm going to know you didn't do it. Is there any like, good way to analytically um, solve that? Like come up with some sort of theoretically? If you knew what the real distribution is, right? So for the normal approximation, it's really difficult because you're dealing with the wrong distribution. So people would back solve for n, and it'll tell you what n is going to be, but you're assuming the distribution was normal in the first place. So I think you could do it with the beta, though and do that. You can't exactly invert the equation, but you could probably come up with some numerical technique to do it. I don't know if you could write down an exact formula. Maybe. You'd have gamma functions all over the place, things like that. Um, so probably. And if you come up with one, I'll give you an extra credit point. How about that? It's a good question. But for the normal, you back solve for it, think you have it, and you would be wrong way too small because you'd be assuming normality. And then what happens in the tails is it's not exactly normal. You know it's not normal in the tails because it's bounded by 0 and 1. Let's talk about that just for a second. Why do we like normality?
This isn't a philosophical question. So, the normal distribution. Why do we like it? Where does it come from? People use it all the time. Where the heck does it come from? Central limit there, maybe. So that might not be the first thing that ever came up, but it's always used in conjunction with sums. And the central limit theorem addresses sums. So the idea is, is that x bar, so this might be the answer. It's almost the answer as to where it came from in the first place. So about 100 years before the central limit theorem was created, somebody else had done something with it. But it did concern sums in binomial approximations. So x bar. So this is sum of the x odds over n. i goes from 1 to n, so just the average. And I'm going to just put a little notation right here to remind us this is a function of n. It has something to do with the n. So x bar n is approximately, now I'm going to say the prox. So I'm going to write it like that. So that it's not exactly distributed this way. So it's distributed normally with some mean and some variance. So does the central limit theorem say this? Is that what the central limit theorem says? So something like this. This is if, and oh, and I should probably write divided by n here, if n is large. So the idea is, is that these xi's right here, they could have come from any distribution, almost any distribution. So very few things I need to say about this distribution to have a result like that approximately hold. So what I need is I need f to have finite variance. It better have finite variance if we're going to talk about variance of an average process. That kind of makes some sense. So that it would be finite variance. That finite variance is that number right here. So that's this number. It's the variance of the xi's themselves. This f doesn't need to be normally distributed. You don't even need this, the IID thing. But if I write that in, it makes the proof easier. So there's some form of dependencies you can have, and it's still normally distributed. So, but this is about the central limit theorem. This is how we use it. Xi's come from any old random distribution, have no idea what it is, don't feel like figuring it out, don't want to model it, don't understand at the individual level what's going on. That's complicated, but if I average all of my individuals, then the average, if n is reasonably big, this thing is approximately normally distributed, and most people will just say it's normally distributed. And they'll use it just like that. So this might be the engineer's approach to the central limit theorem. So this is how you use it. There's probably a more precise way of saying this. The CLT says this x bar n minus mu divided by sigma. I'll write it like this. So this is the standard error. It's just the square root of the variance term. So it's the standard error of the process. If this had mean mu in the first place, subtracting so off mu, it's that mu, would be a normal zero process, would be a it would have zero mean. And if I divide by the standard error, I turn the variance into one. So this is just basic standardization right here. If I took the limit of this thing as n goes to infinity, this thing right here is normally distributed with these parameters, zero and one. I've subtracted off the mean, it's exactly that thing, and the variance, the standard error is here. And so that's what actually happens. And a lot of people end up writing, this converges to a normal distribution. The question is, is, is this an OK approximation if n is relatively small and what's n? So you could be kind of studying this on the simulation example and see, is normality even kicked in? And it takes a long time. 
especially if P is small in this example, or if P is large, for normality to kick in. So, people will say all kinds of things in their theory classes. Well, it converges at rate square root of n, I can see that right here. So as this goes to zero, this thing is converging. Right here, how fast does that converge at square root of n? That's relatively fast, so it should happen. So if you're a mathematician, you'll like that. If you're an engineer, you go, well, did it converge or not? So for my 45 data points, is that good enough? And so mathematician will say lots of things. Well, let me prove some stuff to you. Same question is on the table. Did it happen? And you might be wondering whether or not you should use those approximations. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. But if you didn't check in some sort of a simulation experiment, you probably have no business doing it. So let's re-encounter our earlier problem. This is our example one. We'll use this to segue back to the normal example, but we have our XIs are coming from a Bernoulli. So if I end up modeling everything, some of the XIs, it's not normally distributed. If I divide by n, it's not normally distributed. But a lot of people will use that approximation. This is actually, I'll say some of the xi's divided by n. This is maybe normally distributed with parameter p, p, 1 minus p divided by n. That's what we think, right? It's not. This is where the approximation comes from. It's binomial. If I get rid of that n right there, this has parameter p and whatever that toggle is, the sample size right there. So that appears here. So the question is, is that normal approximation even reasonable? Keep in mind, central limit theorem has something to do with sums, and this is a sum. And that's the first indicator that a normal approximation for this distribution might be reasonable. So again, the question is, is how fast did it actually converge? The rates don't matter. You know, there's always a constant out in front and you never know what it is for any given problem. It has everything to do with what F is, but because you're avoiding the question about F, you don't know. So Bayesian does this thing. So the Bayesian says, you want to learn P, they're going to build up this, given some of the XIs. I could just call that my whole vector of ones, or I could end up writing that out as cap X, something like that. To me, they're all the same. So this is the posterior distribution, and this is going to be beta with these two parameters. Some of the XIs plus alpha. n minus some of the xi's plus beta. So we spent a lot of time working through that. That's that posterior distribution. There is an assumption right here that the prior that I used was beta half and half. One thing to realize about this answer right here is it involves the sum of the xi's. And even if I had built this up from the Bernoulli side of everything and not talk about the binomial, I still would have gotten this exact answer. So there's some idea that maybe the CLT will start impacting those things. And in a grad class that's dealing with theory, they would talk about all these asymptotics. Please. Why do we need it to be beta half half specifically, not beta alpha beta? Oh, sorry. This is half alpha and beta. You've got me just doing things out of habit. So the first prior I'll run to is the beta half half. It has a lot to do with that picture I drew. It has to do with transform invariance. It has to do with being an optimal frequentist. And I haven't gone into all those details quite yet. So alpha and beta. Half half are good choices. So let's just look at this simulation one more time.
we ran this simulation quite a few times. I'm going to keep these numbers about the same, 0.4, beta half, 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 half. You'll be playing around with this code, I presume. It's on the website. And here's n. So I'll just write down again. Here's n is 5. P was 0.4. We'll run this thing. Let's see where my plot went. There it is. There's my posterior distribution. So here's my posterior right here. I P was 0.4. You can already tell me what happened in the simulation. I didn't show you the draws. Do you know what they were by glancing at this posterior? Zero, 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 zero. We got four zeros in a row. That's why it's stacking so much weight over here. That happened. P was 0.4 possible to get all zeros. The MLE for this would be zero. The standard error would be zero. The normal distribution that you would be trying to model would be a point mass at zero. Does that even look like a normal distribution at all? Nothing like it. So let's run the simulation just a little bit longer. You can see all my draw zero, zero, zero. We can just tell because of the way it's stacked mass. Let's run this a whole bunch of times. Let's do 19 times. No normality should kick in for that. Kind of. So it's starting to look kind of normal if you look at this posterior distribution. It's not a normal because it found it between 0 and 1, so it's truncated, but there's not much mass in there. But you can see the CLT starting to kick in for this thing. So the Bayesian has the ability to move over to the CLT inadvertently, they're not doing it on purpose, they're still using a beta distribution to model everything. But if n was relatively small, they wouldn't be describing this as a normal. So I think that there's a lot of flexibility to this analysis, that it actually does well in smaller sample sizes. And that's not something you hear people talk about because we could have discovered this back in the 60s. We'll point out it was in the 70s that Jerry Brown over at UPenn figured out that beta half half was the optimal frequentist prior to use if you're going to be a Bayesian. It's very hard to be a Bayesian when they're optimal frequentists because then they have best of both worlds. Let's just run this again. If I crank this up to, let's say, 500, this will run for a long time. Remember, the prior that I'm using is this beta half half that is U shaped. This U-shape phenomena helps to explain why the credible intervals cover better than the asymptotic frequentist intervals. Start looking at this thing, and it's starting to look more and more normal as it goes through everything. But again, the Bayesian's not using a normal distribution to model this. It's going to start going off the plot in a second. But you can use your imagination. That peak is climbing way up there. One thing you start to see is the this area that the Bayesian is interpreting is a belief statement about P. This is where they believe P is. That's what the posterior means for them. It's getting peakier and peakier, and it's getting tighter and tighter around the truth. Why is that happening? It has everything to do with the likelihood function. So I'd say the prior is not the driving force of the analysis. The prior is helping us do things around the endpoints. It's helping us with low sample size to come up with more reasonable things. But after a while, the impact of the prior wears off dramatically. And that's because the likelihood is getting peakier and peakier and peakier, and that's what likelihood functions tend to do. Now, in a typical grad inference book, they would say under certain regularity conditions, everything's differentiable, things are smooth, it's a finite variance process, then the maximum likelihood will converge to the actual truth. So if I kept running that for infinity or some huge number, it would collapse to a point mass right there. And it's because the likelihood is going to start collapsing to that point mass. Does anybody know who may or is usually credited with the statement that likelihoods are consistent, i.e. they'll start converging to the truth? It's von Mises. So von Mises' theorem says something about it. And he's got like 17 regularity conditions to show that this happens. Obviously, if the maximum is on the end of the space, you can't use all that calculus stuff we learned a long time ago. You need to check the endpoints in this space. 
So it's those basic things that we see in calculus. So the prior is wearing off. So this is one reason to think you don't want to change your prior depending on sample size. You want your prior to stay the same so that the likelihood starts driving the inference. So I always say likelihoods are the driving force. It's not priors. It's not even necessarily the way that I think about bays. It's just the likelihood. So saying that, the, the penalties and the regularizers, i.e. the prior, can be useful around boundaries of spaces, or if you wanted to encode some information that wasn't inside of your, your sampling. Please. So you said that some interpretations say that as n approaches infinity, it converges to uh, the normal distribution. But if you have p bounded between 0 and 1, they can't converge. Yeah. It's true. It's converging. So remember, this is a concept. This is not a real thing. So it's a concept that it's limiting to it. So you have to use your imagination when we invoke infinity. It's not reality. So it's getting closer and closer and closer. The reason we say it like this is we want all the ends to be over on the left-hand side. If I ended up taking the limit over here, I took the limit here, this would degenerate to zero. So, so it's a concept. And if you don't like those concepts and you say it never happens any, anyway and I don't like it, don't be an asymptotic frequentist. Be a conditional statistician. And a good way to be a conditional statistician, conditioning on your actual data set, is to be a Bayesian. So what is doing all the conditioning? The likelihood function. The, basic, the prior is some sort of a penalty. So it doesn't, it doesn't happen completely. But if you're an engineer, you might go, wow. So people do use it like that. So I would argue no reason to use it like that because the Bayesian answer is better. It restricts you to 0, 1 always. Guaranteed to be in 0, 1 right here. So no real approximation. It's limiting to a normal as well. It never quite gets there. But you never called it a normal. You called it a beta. When n is big, that beta starts to look more and more normal. That's surprising that it happens. So I wouldn't have guessed that just by looking at the function. But that is what happens. Let's go back to the normal example. This is where we'll pick up next time. Let's just jump straight into normality. Let's say our data was normal, so when I took averages, it's normal too. Typically, that's not exactly what happens. Usually, people are invoking the central limit theorem. So we're inspired by the central limit theorem, at least, to study normality. So this was example two. X eyes. distributed with mean mu and variance sigma squared. I'm going to say this is known for now. If you can anticipate a future lecture, I'll let that not be known. And we'll deal with it. So xi's are coming from this normal distribution. So f of x given mu, and I'll write it down with sigma squared just because I'm used to doing it, but because I said that was known, Sometimes I'll stop writing it. So this is going to look like this. f of x, which is just your vector of data, x1 to xn. This is just this. i goes from 1 to n, 1 over square root 2 pi, sigma, e to the minus 1 half, xi minus mu, squared over sigma squared. I'm producting everything together because I'm assuming everything is IID here. So of course it's IID. I haven't said anything about any dependencies. They're all coming from this basic distribution. I'm sampling them the same way every single time. So I could have written this down. I could have ended up just jumping straight to x bar, which is the sum of the x i's divided by n, and modeled that. And what I want you to try and convince yourself before next time is that if I do Bayesian inference, square root of n there, 
e to the minus one half x bar minus mu squared over sigma squared over n. If I do Bayesian inference using this function or that function, I will get exactly the same answers. The way you convince yourself of that is by proving that these are proportional to each other. So I'm going to start saying prop 2. That's actually the function in latex backslash prop 2. We'll give you that proportionality sign. So they're proportional to each other. We'll come back next time. We'll pick up on it that this is true. We could do inference on either one. I'll say a few things like I did last time, that x bar is the sufficient statistic for mu, so we only have to study that. If you didn't know that, I'll give you some hints on being able to pick up on that and what it actually means. But it means I don't actually need all the xi's, all I need to do is play around with mu. I also want you to think about the nature of this parameter mu that we're going to do inference on. So it's the mean. But it's also a location parameter, which means that if I move that parameter mu by delta units right here, if it were here before, and then I shift it over by delta units, mu plus delta, the mu center is going to be there, and this actually is delta units apart from each other. So that's that distance between that. So it's a linear shift location parameter. I slide it five units, the whole distribution slides five units. This is going to inspire us to think about not wanting to put information into our prior that has information about the location of the distribution. So I might be able to encode some information in the prior, but I don't want to inject information about the location because that's the interpretation and I want the data to drive that. So that kind of starts to make some sense to us, that we don't want to be informative about the location if we really don't know what it is and we want the likelihood to tell us all about it. We'll come back next time, study the normal distribution, and then walk through this location analysis. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is start thinking about the nature of that parameter. This is a scale parameter. So it relates to multiplying the xi's by something, not shifting them, which is adding something to the xi's. So we'll go a little bit slow with this, but this is foundational to everything we're going to do in the future. So make sure you understand everything there is to understand about this normal distribution because it keeps coming back. Thanks so much, you guys. I will see you on Friday. My intent is to post the lecture. It's a two-lecture combination on Friday. Is that working for everybody? Any strong requests that I posted today? Thanks, y'all. Like that, I'll get to that soon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's start up, everybody. Welcome back. So sorry for the side conversation about spatial statistics. We were indulging ourselves. Let's come back to um, the normal mean posterior that we're working on. So the idea is, is we want to learn the mean parameter or the location parameter given all of our data. So sometimes I talk about all of our data and one of the terms I like to use is realizations. So realizations are not the x size space, it's actually a point in that space. So sometimes people will talk about the x size is a random variable and that's the actual space that everything lives in, but once you sample you get a number in that space and that's what we call realizations or data. So you'll hear people mince all those terms, so just be prepared for that. Um, but this is a, a term I like to talk about. So when I say that, what I really mean is our observations. And I'll just say these are observed. So, and that's what I mean when I write it on the right-hand side of the bar, right there, that that's fixed and observed, that's a known thing. I'm also being really pedantic in talking about the variance right here, so in writing it into everything. Um, some people would just do this. So I think in my old textbook, they would just start out and they would say, we're doing this analysis right here. So pi mu given x. If that happened, something's happening over here. There's a fly in the sentence. Oh, <laughs> so that fly is distracting me too. So, okay. Um, 
So some people would just write this. And if I saw this notation right here, I'd be thinking, is it something like this? Did you do this right here where I've got sigma squared given x, the joint distribution, and we'll study this distribution soon enough. We're not there yet. And I've integrated over sigma squared. So you integrate out sigma squared over the whole space, that's marginalization. So the question mark here is, does this notation mean that? And if you drew a, wrote it out, and you've integrated out sigma squared, there is no sigma squared in this model. But the notation will be fairly obvious once you glance the answer. If you're actually writing down sigma squared and using it in the equation, then it's known and fixed. So, and people will just differ on this notation. So anytime I see something like this, my immediate question is, are you just not writing down the fixed parameters or did you marginalize them out? And if I stare at the equation, I can figure it out for myself. Is sigma squared in there? So just be aware that some people use their notation a little bit differently. Since we're in class and doing things on the chalkboard, there's no real expense to writing that down. So I will be really obvious about this, and maybe later on I'll stop writing it down, and you'll have to use your judgment on whether or not I've integrated it out or not. How do you tell the difference? Is sigma squared in the equation or not? So I will have you work through that integral soon enough. So that's homework too. So that's coming. Okay. So we want to build this posterior. What does it mean? It's our probability distribution on this parameter that I can think of as either a mean, and that's a mathematical thing. So that means it's the expected value. So this is this right here. Expected value of the xi's. How do I get that? Right there, I look at the integral of xi times fxi, given the mean in sigma squared dxi. And I'm integrating between negative infinity and infinity. So I'm just integrating over this function right here and taking the average of it. So if you work through that, you would find out that this thing right here is mu. And most of us just know that. So if you would like to actually work through that integral and do it, how do you solve that integral? Does anybody know? The integrate over our Gaussian function. Anybody ever do this exercise? I did it when I was a freshman in college. So I sat there, I was really proud of myself, sitting there on the steps working through this, and I finally figured out how to do the integration. You remember those days where it's like you've got like seven integration techniques and you're combining them in some way trying to do this. Anybody have an answer? You do put it in like 3D. Yeah. 2D. You put the Jacobian magic on it, and eventually you have the square of it. And you can take the square root and not get <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Stuff, stuff, stuff. You drop it into polar coordinates. So put it into a circle, and you can do that integration. I won't walk you through that, but if you're curious how to do it, you do it in polar. So if anybody's forgotten how to do integration in polar, I won't put you on it in this class. So that's the only mention I'll make of it. Yes, but um, if we're doing the expectation that you have a factor of x in there. Yeah, so you have to do parts first. Right. So you need to do parts and then polar. So fun, good times. <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's more of an undergrad sort of thing that we would walk through. I'm not going to have you doing difficult integrations in this class. I'll probably keep it to like polynomials or something that you know how to do. So any integrations that we study on the chalkboard are fair game, and I'm not going to do this one. OK, so we know what we're trying to do. Let's just write down what the distribution looks like right here. So this distribution is a function over f of xi given mu and sigma squared. So it's just this function right here, and this axis represents the xi's. So where is this thing centered? It's centered at mu, and it has standard deviation sigma. So I would probably mess up this language while I'm talking on the board. Instead of talking about sigma, I'd probably talk about the variance, and sometimes I say the variance. But I mean the standard deviation. And so you can do that transform in your mind. So sometimes I talk about the standard deviation and I circle that. 
So I do the same thing that used to annoy me in class, and I do it to you guys. So I'm going to pass it on to you guys, and you can pass it on to the next generation. Just butchering the notation. For the record, this is the standard error based off of n observations. So I goes from 1 to n. Okay. So just some things to know about this distribution. Let's just study a few basic facts that we'll recycle over and over again in this class. So I think I said the likelihood function looks like this. It's going to be proportional to e to the minus 1 half x bar minus mu squared over sigma squared over n. So that's just something I'm writing down automatically. I jump straight to that. That might not be obvious to you, but if you've taken an inference class lately, that's an automatic step for you. Let's just show that that's true. So this right here is just the arithmetic mean. Sum of the xi's divided by n, where I'm summing up n data points. Very often I'll write an n down there, and sometimes I don't. So usually when I'm thinking about a limit, I like to put that n in there so that we know to treat this as a function of n, and when I'm not taking a limit, then I don't use that notation. So I'll be slightly inconsistent about that. If I didn't know this, I could have just built this up from scratch. So I could just say product i goes from 1 to n, and I could just write down the sampling distribution. I'm saying it's the likelihood, and what I'm thinking about when I write it this way is that this is a function of mu. So I'm being slightly inconsistent with my notation all of a sudden when I'm writing this over here. So I don't actually mean that this is a function of xi's, this is a function of mu right here. So how do you build up your likelihood functions? In an IIB case, you take your sampling distribution and you just product over it. So in dependent cases, there are going to be some product probably as well, but you need to be careful in how you product things. We will see examples like that later in class, where the whole name of the game is write down the likelihood function correctly, and if you can get through that, you can solve all the bits and pieces of the problem. So we'll see that in about a month or two. So I can just build this up. I goes from 1 to n. I can waste some shock real quick and write down the normalizing constant. I don't need to write this part down because this is a function over mu and this thing doesn't involve mu right here, the normalizing constant. So I'll just write that down constant because it doesn't involve mu. And then I just write this down. e to the minus 1 half xi minus mu squared sigma squared. So that's just the sampling distribution, the arithmetic form of the sampling distribution that I'm thinking about as a function over mu. So I've made this conceptual leap to think about likelihood functions. On the chalkboard, you can't distinguish whether or not I'm talking about a likelihood function or a sampling distribution if I write it down this way. This is also the joint sampling distribution, but that would be a function over the xi's, where instead we're looking for a function over mu. So I could just drop that out right away and not even think about that piece. So keep in mind, likelihoods are always proportional to something. So I can multiply by any constant. I'm just going to toss that. So now I'm just going to write this down. This is e to the minus 1 half. I'm going to take my product and drop it into the exponent. So the product over exponential functions is the exponential to the sum over those functions. i goes from 1 to n xi minus mu squared over sigma squared. So that's what that looks like. So I'm going to write this down again by expanding the square. So I'm just going to expand everything. Let me do it in two steps. i goes from 1 to n xi squared minus 2 xi, I'm going to write it out like this, xi mu plus mu squared divided by sigma squared. 
Very often, when I'm thinking about this parameter right here, I usually write that one out in front. So, it doesn't matter how we do it. Usually, when I'm thinking about the random variable, whatever the random variable is going to become is the one that I usually recognize right out in front here. So, I'm just going to do that swap. In high dimensions, be careful on all of this stuff. So, if you're working with vectors and matrices, make sure that you're multiplying in the correct direction. How do you do that? Write down the dimensions until you get used to it and make sure that those dimensions are conformal. So these are scalars, so I didn't even have to think about anything to do that. So we will eventually recognize this in higher dimensional form. So that's one way of writing everything down. I'm just going to write it down again. Let me get rid of that. Slightly differently, I'm just going to expand this sum. I always leave this minus one and a half out in front and I make sure it's there. So if it's there, I can recognize everything perfectly. If it's not there, then I need to multiply and divide by something so I can recognize the minus one half algebra. So this is gonna look like this. E to the minus one half. This will be sum of the xi squareds plus two mu sum of the xi's plus sum over this constant function right here. So I'm just going to write that down as n times mu squared divided by sigma squared. So same exact thing. I'll put some indices on here. It's kind of unfortunate when we do work with a high dimensional case, usually our high dimensional covariance function we denote with sigma. And usually we sum across that thing as well. So my sigmas mean two different things in future examples. We'll be careful about that. So probably important to label your indices so you don't recognize this as a parameter. Anyway, that's one way of writing everything down. This is exactly the same thing. This is the likelihood. So it's a function of mu, and it's got these functions right here. So let's just rewrite this and expand everything and make sure that we recognize these are ultimately the same things. So we'll go really slow and then eventually we'll go really fast with this. So this right here looks like this. E to the minus one half x bar minus mu squared sigma squared over n. So I'll just expand the square, e to the minus one half, x bar squared minus two mu x bar plus mu squared. This is sigma squared over n. So again, I just expanded everything. So let's recognize that these are exactly the same things. Instead of writing down the x bar squared, so I don't even have to think about this term. And I'll just point that out. So I'm just going to do one more step over here. So and just remind us this is e to the minus 1 half. This is going to be n times mu squared, this term, plus, this is minus. Make sure you correct that. So I just expanded all of this stuff, that's a minus term. So minus two mu, sum of the xi's, this is going to be divided by, this is getting really messy, that sigma squared is over here. So dividing all of this, so divided by sigma squared. And I'm going to multiply by e to the minus one half sum of the xi squared over sigma squared. So that's this term. So all I've done in this equation is just factorized out this bit. So, and I've retained the parts that include mu. That's this part, a quadratic term. I'll say that's quadratic. And this term is linear. 
And often I say the minus two linear term. So because there's a minus two sitting out in front of it. So this is linear. So there's two terms in this kernel. So in the bulk of the function that we're studying, and that's what I'm calling the kernel. Everything that I need to understand about the function involves mu, and the other part I can just get rid of. That has no mu, so no dependency on mu. Again, this is a function over mu. So I can just toss that because I've gotten rid of the normalizing constants already. So the question is, is this function that? I can similarly toss this. So this is going to be e to the minus 1 half. This is going to be mu squared over sigma squared over n minus 2 mu x bar sigma squared over n. And I'm going to just factorize out the quadratic term in the data sigma squared over n. So while these terms aren't exactly, oh, actually they are exactly the same, you can verify to yourself that this term right here, no, they're different. They're slightly different, but they don't involve mu. So you can verify that for yourself, but I can do something similar right here and just toss that. It doesn't involve mu. So the question is, is, is this equal to that? function is x bar, this is going to be sum of the xi's divided by n. This n goes upstairs and kicks out that one. And I'm left with just sum of the xi's. So in front of my that term. So that's exactly the same. But the same thing happens over here. So this n goes upstairs, n times mu squared, and that's exactly this term right there. So these are the same functions. So all we've done is just expand the square and recognize that these two functions are the same. So I've got a likelihood function from you and I can write it down all kinds of different ways. I'll just point out when we did all the expansion we realized this has something to do with some of the xi's right here. So everything that involves mu also includes the data through the function sum of the xi's. And if we are being really pedantic, it involves sum of the xi's divided by n, which is the mean, which is a very good indicator that all we need to think about is x bar. But we verified it by doing some simple algebra. So our likelihood function again for mu I can write down just in terms of x bar. I could have written this down in terms of all of the x's, but I noticed the only bit of information I really need is x bar. So sometimes I write it down with that. Sigma squared, and I just write this thing down. So this is my likelihood function. x bar minus mu squared over sigma squared over n. So don't forget to divide by that n when you write it down in terms of x bar. If you forget what this actually looks like, just do the product thing and work through everything. It'll just waste a few strokes of a pen and paper. So on a test, that might not, it might not mean much on the chalkboard, but on a test, it's probably saving you a couple minutes. So there's the likelihood. So we're done with that. Question is, is what does this function look like? It kind of looks almost exactly like this function that we wrote down, which is the sampling distribution. So it looks very similar, except it's centered in a different place. So I could rewrite this again and just spin those two things around. For me, I usually like to see whatever is the variable on the left-hand side and whatever the center of everything is on the right-hand side. I just prefer it that way because I've been indoctrinated. So that's the way we always recognize it. So this function looks like it's centered around x bar and it's got some standard error in here. And I'll write that down as sigma over root n just to be consistent with what I did right here. And I just wrote it down in terms of sigma. That's called the scale parameter of everything. So 
on the chalkboard, that function and that function look awfully similar to each other. And that's why I don't like to start with this example, because it's hard to distinguish what is the sampling distribution that looks like that, and what is the likelihood it looks like that. They almost look the same. They're centered in different places, and their scale is different. But on the chalkboard, they look eerily similar. So the binomial example I kind of like because the sampling distribution and the likelihood don't look like each other at all. Okay, so that's our likelihood function. sure you have answers to that already. So we want pi mu given x and sigma squared, and this is going to be proportional to the likelihood function, x sigma squared times r prior. So we need some sort of a prior distribution. Now, I've already made a statement on the board. So I've made an assumption here. Can anybody spot what my assumption is? Just looks like basis theorem, but I've actually just inserted an assumption about this analysis. Let's remember this. Bayes' theorem says this. So I'm going to write this down as probability of A given B is, e is proportional to probability of B given A times the probability of A. We're all in agreement, right? So that's basis theorem, what we wrote down. I've just thrown away the normalizing constant, which is the margin of B. So the way that a Bayesian uses this basis theorem is they just use the numerator. So what about this? What if I ended up building in one more random variable in here? So I'll leave that up. Let's say we have this probability of A given B, and I'm going to have this new random variable. Let's call it C right here, and I'm going to build that thing up. What I need to do to do that is I need B given A and C times the probability of A given C. If you wanted to see the full equal sign thing, this is the probability of B given C, right here. So this is just an obvious extension of Bayes' theorem. So that actually is Bayes' theorem. Nobody would argue. I don't even need to think like a Bayesian to do this. So lots of non-Bayesians use this conditional form. These are rules of probability. I call it Bayes' theorem, but some people would just call it rules of conditional probability. So if I'm conditioning on C here, so that means C is fixed, it needs to be conditioned on everywhere. So the easiest way to remember this is if you see that's conditioned on right here, it's fixed. Everything else needs to fix it. So in condition on it. The analysis is conditional on C, so it's conditioned on C everywhere. So what assumption have I made by writing this down? What am I missing in my notation? Sigma squared, yeah. So I probably mean this, given sigma squared. And so if I were being a full-blown probabilist and looking at the equation and making sure I understand it, I would probably write conditional on sigma squared. 
So if I write it without sigma squared in there, I'm making a statement about independence of those two parameters a priori. So I'm saying that my prior is independent for mu, independent of sigma squared. So if I just leave sigma squared out. And so I kind of like that. I kind of like to write this down like this because it tells me I'm not injecting any information about sigma squared. Let's just ask ourselves, just rationally, if I knew what sigma squared was, so if I said I collected a lot of data, I'm not going to show, you, show it to you quite yet, so we're going to form some prior beliefs. I'm going to tell you what the variance is. It's five. What do you think the mean should be? I'm giving you all this information. So variance is five. Does that tell us anything about the mean? I don't think so. So there are different things. Let me ask the question real quickly, a slightly different question. In this analysis, is the mean and the variance independent of each other? Or are they actually independent? I can't hear you. It feels like they should be. So I'm going to ask this question. So I'm going to be a little bit more thorough about this. Question, is mu independent Now I've inserted a bunch of ideas into this question in the first place. If I weren't a Bayesian, I would say, I don't even know what you're talking about. So I've already upgraded mu and sigma squared to random variables to talk about them this way. So I could just say, is there any functional dependence? Do they have anything to do with each other and not invoke the statistical word independent? So how would we even check this? So we talked about this distribution before. So obviously I'm thinking about something like this. This joint distribution. And I'm thinking, are these two random variables independent of each other? How do we check that? We factorize it. So if they factorize from each other, they're independent of each other. So the question is, is would these ever factorize apart from each other? I haven't said anything about the prior on this. But what I would need to look at is the likelihood function. So the question is, is in the likelihood function, do the mean and the variance factorize apart from each other? Can I write it down as a function of mu and a function of sigma squared? Got that. Let's just write this down one more time and just think of it as expanded form. I'll say e to the minus 1 half. This is going to be mu squared minus 2 mu x bar plus x bar squared. And this is over sigma squared. This is over sigma squared. This is over sigma squared. So I've just dropped my sigma squared across all of this. This is divided by n, divided by n, divided by n. I make mistakes all the time. So these are exactly the same thing. Can I untangle sigma squared from mu? I could do this. I could factorize this out. We don't even need to look at that. So that's not even informative because it doesn't have the mu in there. Question is, is could I ever factorize that mu from that sigma squared? How about that one? You can't. So you can try as hard as you can. You don't even need a, a theorist to come in and help you and tell you you can't do it because you just can't do it. So by the rules of third grade. So there's no way to untangle those. So the likelihood actually models a dependence between these two parameters. So a posteriori, sigma squared and mu have something to do with each other. There's a slightly different question. A priori, before I see any data, should I be modeling the dependence between mu and sigma squared? I would have to know something to do that. And in our analysis, I haven't told you anything to base anything off of. So there are ways to do it, but I would say intuitively, since we're doing a one-dimensional analysis in the first place, there probably isn't any information we should encode into that. Please. Um, so we're fixing the set of data. 
And it, I feel like intuitively they should definitely be dependent because if, say, like you move mu very far down, should that change what sigma squared it is? I don't think so. So I don't think that's the difference. Defer a given set of data. Yeah, you know, if I slide mu, it just slides that location around, but the shape of the distribution is the same. So, yeah, so it's something for you to ponder, but I would say one thing we can easily agree on is we don't have any great insights on how to encode the information about variance into the mean. So a priori, you might not know anything about the mean if I told you the variance is five. So I think this is actually pretty rational to just say my prior beliefs are independent of each other. So a priori, I'm modeling the mean independently of the variance, but I'm not actually saying that they're independent of each other. In the posterior analysis, um, they are dependent. Here's a fact, something for you to chew on. We'll come back around to this later once we study the variance a little more. X bar and S squared you know what x bar is already. S squared is this parameter. Xi minus x bar squared divided by n minus 1. So that's this typical unbiased sample estimator. It's actually biased in the variance, but it's unbiased. It's actually biased in the standard deviation, but it's unbiased in the variance. So the question is, is, is the unbiased characteristic even important? So we buy it, come up with a biased estimator for sigma, but an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. So what does sigma even mean to us? Would we want to be unbiased in sigma, but biased in sigma squared? I'll tell you that you can't have them both. You have to choose. This is just a fact that we usually learn in basic inference class that these two sampling these two functions of the data, these two statistics are independent of each other. So in terms of the data they factorize from each other, you could actually prove that. You'd have to build up the joint distribution of x bar and s squared. I'll just do some of the math for you up front. The Jacobian, you can just forget about them. It's not going to be a function of either one of them. So it's a constant. So anyway, we won't prove that, but it's a different statement than saying mu and sigma squared themselves have no dependence. Okay. This is only true for a normal distribution. There's no other distribution in the universe where that's actually true. So something to think about. Okay, we've got our, at least some understanding of how we want to pick this prior in the first place. If I told you variance, it probably wouldn't give us too much information. So pi mu given x and sigma squared is going to be proportional to the likelihood function. I'll write it out. E to the minus one half mu minus x bar squared sigma squared divided by n. Times our prior in my notation is specific. I'm indicating that my prior beliefs are independent of the variance. So that's what I've written down. If I were just following probability theory and writing this down, I would say, where did sigma squared go? So I would ask that question probably. Now, after years and years of experience, I know what it's meant. So I'm not modeling any dependence in my prior. So and I think that that's probably OK. So the question is, is how do we pick that thing in the first place? I want to bring us back to this discussion that mu is a location parameter. So if I slide mu by delta units, the whole distribution slice by delta units. So it's a linear shift parameter. It's a location parameter. It's also the mean. It's also the median. It's also the mode of the distribution. It's got a lot of things. So, but what's its interpretation? It's a linear shifting parameter. So how do I know that? Because I stare at this equation and I study it and I know what it means because I went to high school. So somebody told me about shifting a, a function. So, mu itself is linear shift. There's reason to think that you might not want to encode information in your prior on the location of the distribution. So, I'll just motivate that a little bit. So, we 
might want a prior. That's location invariant. So I've just been introduced us to a new word. So invariance. Let me say it again. We might want a prior that doesn't encode information about the mean. And then I make this statement. We want a prior that's location invariant. So what I mean is that if I slide that distribution around, I want my prior to not affect the inference in any special way. So if I slide the distribution, I change what mu is in the sampling function, and I do my inference, it should have all the same properties. So invariance means I've changed something, but something else does not change. So I wiggle something around, but the thing I'm interested in is still. That's what I mean by invariant. So anytime you hear the word invariant, you think, what's the change? And what's the thing that you're preserving? So what I want to preserve is if I change what mu is in the analysis, I want my analysis to basically not depend on information about that mu, that true mean. So I want my inference to have all the same properties. So same sort of MSE results, same sort of all kinds of properties. It shouldn't matter what mu is. I still have the same performance in my analysis. That's certainly not true for P in a binomial distribution. As P moves over towards the boundaries, the inference changes. And we've seen that a couple different ways, and you'll study that on your homework set, that the confidence intervals actually change. So P is not a location parameter. So and the beta half-half isn't preserving information about the location. So it doesn't have that interpretation. This analysis is a little bit easier. So here's my question is, how do I pick a prior that has this property? Here's the way you would think about it. I have a distribution that if I slide it back and forth, I can't tell that I slid it back and forth. So the prior itself doesn't encode in any information about the location. So the prior doesn't have any location info. Lots of different ways to say the same thing. So let me just say that again. If I take this function and I slide it back and forth and say you can't tell, what is that function? Yeah. So if I had a function like this that had a big bump in it and I slid it back and forth, you'd be able to tell that I'm sliding it back and forth. How would I tell? I'd just look at the axis and see where the bump is and see that it's sliding back and forth. The normal distribution doesn't have that property. But a flat function, a constant function, that looks maybe something like this, pi mu, if it looked flat, And it goes from negative infinity to infinity. So I can conceptualize that function and I slide it back and forth. You won't be able to tell that I slid it. Now you have to use your imagination to do that. I can't actually draw this thing going off to negative infinity and infinity. It's a concept. But we could imagine that if I slide this function back and forth, it's the same function. That's what it means to be location invariant. So I could pick this function to have any height and I'll just call this C right here, some constant. And that's pretty arbitrary to me, whatever that constant is. So I'll just remind us if we actually were working with the full-blown form of Bayes' theorem. So if we actually wrote down all of Bayes' theorem, we would have written this down. So pi mu, given x and sigma squared, is going to be equal to the integral likelihood of mu given x, oops, not the integral, that's in the denominator, sigma squared pi mu integral likelihood given x sigma squared pi mu. This is a definite integral, and we're integrating between negative infinity and infinity. 
So just have a look at what happens right here. If I pick that to be any old constant, i.e. a shift invariant prior, it doesn't matter what that constant is. That just cancels. So I could have picked that number to be 10, I could have picked it to be five, I could pick it to be 7,002. And it wouldn't change my analysis. It's the exact same thing that I would get. So my favorite constant function to pick is one, for obvious reasons. Multiply by one, I don't have to write it down anymore. So I've only motivated this prior just based off of some intuition about some property. We'll come back around later and show that the constant function is also the Jeffries prior, it's the reference prior. So in some sense, it's the least informative prior you can come up with. We will come back around to those ideas later on. I haven't told you what those are. That statement's supposed to inspire confidence that there's this intuitive reason why we like the constant for the prior, but there's also more mathematical reasons we'll get into later. So let's just finish this analysis. So let's just assume that we're going to use this prior, we kind of like it, it's got some properties. So pi mu, given x, sigma squared, is going to be proportional to e to the minus one half mu minus x bar squared sigma squared divided by n times one. So and I'll write it down for now just to let us know what we're doing. I used to get confused. If you didn't write down times one, I'd be like, where's the prime? So, and then finally I got comfortable when people didn't multiply by one. But when you're learning something, you want to see all the steps. So I'll leave it in for the moment. So that's our prior distri dis distribution. And so our likelihood function is proportional to the posterior. So that's kind of nice. I would not do this right here unless I was dealing with the location parameter. So flat priors are appealing because you don't have to do anything. So, but I'll say for non-location parameters, they can be bad ideas. So early in the days of statistics, Fisher, who was an ardent anti-Bayesian once upon a time, he would say you can just take the likelihood and treat it as a distribution. So he's going to auto-upgrade all of the parameters to random variables by some magic the only magic wand that exists for that is Bayes' theorem. So in disguise, Fisher was a Bayesian, but he didn't want to admit it. I think Laplace also feels like the first one to say he did. Yeah, I think so. I think that's actually true that Laplace did use the flat prior. He didn't tell us why. He also used, do you know what prior he used on sigma squared? This is just something to think about for later. The prior Laplace said for sigma squared was this. We'll come back around to this later. That's actually Jeffrey's prior. What was Laplace thinking when he came up with that? He was thinking of creating a scaled invariant prior, and that's actually the way he probably conceptualized it. We'll deal with this next week. So let me just ask the question, what is this distribution? How do I make this equal? It's not equal yet, I need to multiply by something. So I need a normalizing constant. So, and that's what basis theorem would give us. So you could work through it and do the integration to come up with a normalizing constant, but I'm just going to ask you a question, can you recognize what it is without doing any math? Let me just ask this question, what distribution is this? It's a normal. So how can I tell it's a normal? Yeah, it's e to the minus some quadratic form in mu. The only distribution that can